Welcome to the Realmcast. I'm your host, the Mortal Kombat Phantom, and with me as always is my co-host, our lore master, Yanni. Welcome, Yanni. Thanks, Phantom. And welcome, Josh Sui, who many fans may know from Midway, especially as Sub-Zero, Liu Kang, and even Kung Lao. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's a real honor. So, Josh, normally we like to start off by asking uh, how Mortal Kombat has kind of affected you throughout you know, your entire life and things like that, but that's what this episode is basically about. So before we get started, who is your favorite Mortal Kombat character? Oh my gosh. Um, all right. So, you know, I, I it's, it's totally biased because uh, Liu Kang, because they use my face for Liu Kang in Mortal Kombat 4. So that's a totally bad answer, right? I mean, totally <laughs> narcissistic uh, but beyond that, uh, I, I really like Kung Lao a lot. And I got really good with Kung Lao in, uh, in MK3. And so I, you know, I enjoyed that character um, quite a bit. I love the design of it. Like John Tobias's character designs are just fantastic. And I thought that was one of his best. I have to ask then, because as far as I've seen online, you did not just do Liu Kang for Mortal Kombat 4, but you also did Kung Lao for gold. Is that true or false? No, you know, I saw that somewhere and, you know, it's, it's so weird, like, you would think I would know that, but when gold came out, <laughs> I don't, I just, I just forgot. I never, you know, we were so busy. I wasn't even paying attention. So they, that might be true. I really should look that up. Um, <laughs> the, other, the only other appearance was um, in MK2. If you finish as Sub-Zero, uh, his end story, they use my face for Sub-Zero's face when he takes his mask off. So that was like the first game I ever showed up on, um, you know, over those years. And that was literally, uh, and I think I've said this story a couple of times now. It's uh, that was literally, I think, the first within the first two weeks of me starting at Midway. It, it was like <laughs> the biases came up to me. It's like, hey, can I take a picture of your face because we need it for something in the game? I'm like, all right, you know, sure. And Mortal Kombat obviously was already big at that point because I was for MK2. But I just, you know, it was just one of those things where it was so off the cuff that then like decades later it still pops up you know people will send that to me (laughs) (laughs) two weeks into your into your career with midway and you're already immortalized as kwai liang (laughs) yeah is that crazy (laughs) so you've been of like several different positions throughout your life i mean you've you've been an artist art director producer um and but primarily for midway you were working as an art director like how exactly did this come about? When did you join the the company? So I so I started off, um, yeah, you know, started off as just what they would call a video artist. So you know, so this was um, yeah, in '93, and back then, like Mortal Kombat Two was, I think, it was just about to come out, or it had come out already. Oh no, it was just about to come out, and uh, and so they i came in as a pixel artist and it wasn't it's not like now where you have people who are character artists and environment artists and things like that like we literally did everything so i come in i worked on and my first game was um w it was back then it was called wwf uh wrestlemania the arcade game so the first so i got hired to work on that game that was the nba jam team working on that and i got brought in to work on everything from shooting the characters to cleaning up their there's sprites to working on props to the environments, like special effects, everything like, you know, it, back then teams were so small that everybody had to multitask. So it was just two artists, you know, me and Sal DeVita on that game. And, it, you know, uh, like we were completely unmanaged. So we just did whatever we needed to do to get <laughs> the game done. Um, but from there, like, you know, I, I was I was able to go on to other roles. And by the time I got to um, my first Mortal Kombat game, um, I was a little bit more specialized. I did more environment art. And then, uh, then from there I became, and there was no art director title back then, but that was basically my task on, on the later games was to act as art director. Which one was your first game that you did? The first Mortal Kombat game? Yeah. Oh, that was the, um, the Mortal Kombat mythology sub-zero. Gotcha. Yeah. So I had just finished, um, I just finished WrestleMania. I had worked on um, this game called NHL Open Ice, which is like a NBA Jam hockey game. <laughs> it's uh, which was a lot of fun actually. And uh, and then I jumped. And then John Tobias um, uh, formed a, a second Mortal Kombat team, and so he brought me on to work on that game. So you mentioned that you were well, sort of cast as Sub Zero. Uh, but how did it come about that you were also going to play Liu Kang? Again, it was just like everything, <laughs> everything was so off the cuff, right? And so it was just like, yeah, um, 
and this sounds crazy to say because, but you have to remember this is the '90s, okay? So there was like <laughs> uh, like almost no Asians in the entire building, especially on the <laughs> development team, you know. And so it's kind of like if they needed an Asian face, like nine times out of ten, it would be me. And so where's Josh? It was, <laughs> there, 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 it was, it was. It was just a pure laziness. It's like we don't want to go find somebody. It's like you know whoever's there. And you'll see that in a lot of these games. Um, the faces of the characters are just like the development team people, you know, and even the mocap, you know, some of the mocaps back in the early days was just somebody, it wasn't like a real actor or somebody who can use their bodies really well. It was just some dude that we just found you know, <laughs> you know, around that had put them in a suit. So, uh, so for MK4, it was, uh, Dave Mikitich was the, um, art director for, uh, for that game. And, uh, and me and Dave, we we went to college together, so we were old, you know, we were already old friends at that point. And it was just like, hey, can I use your face for Liu Kang? It's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Take a quick picture. And uh, and then next thing I know, you know, there I am on there. So it's as simple as that. Every character you played what ended up being a Chinese character. Is that your ethnicity or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean type that. So, yeah, it's just like the uh, it's so funny. It's like I, there's uh, you know, one of the funniest stories was there's a game called Revolution X, and I was I'm, I was in that game as different characters, but like one of the characters that got cut out was an evil Japanese businessman. So, so <laughs> my range went from Chinese to to Japanese. Um, luckily, got cut out of the game because it was so unintentionally horribly racist in the way they had that. Character. And I had to I had to hint at them really heavily, like you might not want to release this. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> and this is from the nineties. This was in the nineties, yeah. But the 90s same thing that was yeah. racist in the nineties, uh, like that must have been really bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, even for me, I thought, well, this could go one of two ways, you know. But <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, I was uneasy enough to like hint it at them, and I think I literally like did it in like a Christmas card I sent to the main, the, the head designer. I was like, hey, Merry Christmas. Um, and thanks for bringing shame to my family. And I, <laughs> and he had that card. And when I made into a coin, he actually sent me that card. He showed it to me. He's like, here's that card you sent me. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did you end up working with Midway? Uh, did you end up leaving before the big switch to WB and NRS? Yeah. So I was there from uh, 93 to 99. And, uh, and towards the end, you know, so I had worked on uh, Mortal Kombat, um, the Sub Zero game. Then I worked on Mortal Kombat Four, and then there was another Mortal Kombat adventure game called Special Forces. That I, is, it's a long convoluted story. But I worked on one version of it that ended up not being the version that got released. So there's actually two versions of that game out there, which is really weird. Um, but but at that point, we were work, we were the only team that was working on home games at that point. Everything else was still coin up, and so around '99. Um, you know, like I felt like my career had kind of hit a ceiling there. Um, you know, Midway is kind of, um, boy, for lack of a better way of explaining it, it was like very much an old boys club thing. So you're only going to get so high you know, on the ladder. And, you know, I had, I had some bigger ambitions for lack of a better way of explaining it. So me and John Tobias, Dave Mikicic and some, and a couple of the other MK people, uh, we left Midway at 99, um, seeing that the arcade industry was starting to really die down and there was, there were huge opportunities with consoles. And one of the reasons why we left was uh, we saw, um, you know, Xbox, you know, about it was announced about to come out. And it was just, it just seemed like it was a good time to jump into uh, home games because they were just going to blow up even further. Which sort of happened with Mortal Kombat anyway, as we've all seen over the years. So. Yeah, exactly. Like kind of looking back on it, I mean, what's your opinion about you know the whole special forces drama i guess is a good word for it that kind of came about because that was a big like shift with with all of mortal Kombat. yeah it's uh i mean i can't you know it's hard to say i can't really say much about what happened to it because we're you know we left at that point you know before our version of the game was done um and truth be told the the version of the game we were making was really large it was super ambitious and it, it like in all honesty, looking back on it, it probably would have gotten delayed and got blown out even longer. And it was already like a hellish development cycle to begin with. And so and so I can see them, you know, seeing the team that got left behind to to finish it up. I can see them looking at it saying, this is a mess. You know, it's like either we completely scrap it or we or or we or we just make oh, actually we see that we try to keep working on it but know that knowing that it's going to be hell to do or just start from scratch and do something smaller in, in scope mm -hmm. and so that's likely what happened 
Um, but I just remember when it came out, seeing it, and you know, I still had friends that were working on it on it back at Midway. I remember seeing it, thinking like, like, what the hell happened? Like, this is nothing. <laughs> like, this is nothing like what we were working on, and you know, and it was a it was a massive game. So I I don't know. <laughs> I, I think somebody just this well this year I I guess now it's the new year. Uh, last year just released um sort of prototype version gameplay of it or something. Yeah, there's something floating around out there. So it's uh you know how how playable it actually is is a whole is a whole other question. <laughs> uh, well. Talking about the old game, Special Forces and such, what are your opinion on, I guess, the old games? And then have you also really kept track of the newer games too? Yeah, so, I mean, I, it's like, you know, I, when I left Midway, you know, that was, that was right out, kind of around when MK4 came out, you know. So, um, so my experience with playing Mortal Kombat was up to Mortal Kombat 4. Once, you know, once I left Midway, you know, I started getting into, I, I, much like many game developers, you play games based off of what you're working on, you know? So I went off to do, uh, to work with uh, John Tobias on other fighting games and such. And so, you know, and at that point, MK, like they, they were still, they hadn't come out with Deadly Alliance yet. So at that point, you know, the only references that we had were other companies' games, you know, during that era. So, you know, so so I kind of stopped playing uh, Mortal Kombat games for quite some time. And then I went off to do other games. I, I did, you know, Fight Night and the Tony Hawk series and things like that. So, but I always kind of kept an eye on Mortal Kombat in regards to um, the technology that they're using. So I did, even though I wasn't playing the game, I was looking to see what they were doing because that team is so innovative. They're always doing new things and such. Um, so, I, you know, so long story short, I haven't played many of the, uh, much of the modern games, even though I did, um, play uh quite a bit of nine just because it seemed like that was like the uh that was like a, a nice little reboot that they were that they had going on there uh, but my favorite Mortal Kombat game is still uh mk2 there's just a certain and maybe it's just because i was younger it just it, it, there's a certain freshness to it that i really liked a lot i like mk3 a lot also but there's something about um the look of mk2 i thought was just like that especially of that era was like the was just the best game out of the whole series so recently, uh, kind of like right now, what you're really well known for is the Insert Coin documentary, which uh, like you, sh- you threw it out on Kickstarter, had huge backing. And now I think it has like a worldwide release, basically, um, through digital platforms and things like that. And it, it's like a great story, kind of like the background and, and kind of educational in ways, too, of the whole arcade era, sure. including Mortal Kombat. What made you decide to do this documentary? Man, it was, um, you know, I like I, I I originally went to school for film. You know, I kind of got into video games by accident, really. And so, you know, it was one of those things where I love video game development, you know, and, and I in mean, my career in games, I, I've been it's been very fulfilling and such. Um, but there was always something in the back of my head where it was like, OK, you know, I'm. I'm a little older now. I still haven't made my film. I went to school for this. You know, maybe I should, you know, get back into it. And, 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 you know, this is one of those things where maybe 10 years ago, it would have been more difficult to do, but I kind of saw like how much technology has advanced and how much easier it is to make, you know, to make a film or to make a documentary. And so a lot of things kind of collided at a certain point. And I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to take a break from games and, and make a film. And at the time I wasn't sure what kind of film to make. Um, but I had, um, I had done an interview with the, uh, the website Polygon. Um, they they were very kind enough to do a retrospective of my career. And as I was kind of talking to the uh, do the interviewer, um, I was bringing up all kinds of stories. And and even he was kind of surprised by some of the stuff I was bringing up. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that like all these games of that era coming out of Midway were all coming out of this one tiny little facility that was really crappy i mean it's this really badly <laughs> run no management and it just sounded it, it, then the more i talked about it the more interesting it became to me it's like wow there's a real story here you know not 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 of myself but just all of the people i was working with and the conditions we were working in and just the industry and the 90s in general and so so it seemed like that was kind of for me it was like low-hanging fruit it's like i right, i you know this is the first time i'm trying to make a film why not do it about something that i know really well um, I've always kept great relations with everybody. So maybe they'll, you know, maybe they'll talk to me and interview, you know, you know, let me interview them. 
And, uh, and it worked out really well. I, there were, there were people were all game for it. And I thought, okay, I'll do a Kickstarter, um, just to see if there's interest because, you know, I, I know that these games are really popular out, you know, out there over the years and such, but I was always afraid that, well, maybe, maybe I, it's me that thinks it's popular. Maybe it's not as big as, <laughs> as, as it really is because it's hard to tell, you know, it's coming from my point of view, it's hard to be objective about that. And so the Kickstarter was really just to gauge interest, just to see, it's like, is there a market for this? Are people really that interested? And, uh, and obviously like it, it did really well and obviously people really, you know, wanted to see it. So, so it all, all that just came colliding together. How long did it end up taking you to make the whole movie? Oh man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it took, I mean, it was weird. Like if I were to concentrate the amount of time it took to just the work hours for the film itself, you know, um, it probably was about two and a half to three years. Um, but the actual time, by the time I did the Kickstarter to the release of it was almost six years. And that was about, yeah, about five and a half to six years. And, um, and it was because it, I had gotten the film done pretty early, like pretty quickly, but then it was just all, it was just all of the massaging of it, you know, the polishing, you know, adding little things here and there. And, uh, and I kept only working after a certain point, I only decided, I decided to only work on it when I felt inspired, which is a good and bad thing because it was like, there were just times where I, I didn't touch it for like over a month. And then I would come back and touch it with fresh eyes. So I had that luxury because it's the first project in my life that, I had complete control over. I didn't have producers breathing down my neck, publishers <laughs> asking for things, you know, there's no going over budget on anything. It was just like, I, I can do this in the way I want to do it. So I wanted to um, indulge in it as much as possible because I knew that this may never happen again. So let's just do it this way. That's so cool. Nice. It, as Phantom said, it was very educational, the documentary. And Thanks. one thing I found very, very fascinating actually was now, we all talk about Mortal Kombat as sort of the, the pioneer of really gore and fighting games and such. But, and I was always, well, I always had that impression myself until I saw the documentary. And then there was a game that was brought up right at the start of the documentary, I think, called NARC. And, yeah. well, and when I was watching this gameplay footage, I was like, whoa, how would, did this not get as much sort of attention as MK in terms of gore? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, and, and I think that that was one of the things that, um, that really propelled, um, the storyline. And then the reason for wanting to make this film was that everybody knows about Mortal Kombat, but things don't come out of just nowhere. You know, there, there's always something that inspires, you know, something else. And so NARC was a real revelation for me because I, you know, I, I knew of the game obviously, but I didn't really know all of the stories about it. And, and as I, you know, as I, as I interview people like Eugene Jarvis and Jack Hager, it dawned on me like, like that game specifically set the tone for Midway all the way through the 90s. You know, because that was a game that came out, and I believe in 89. So right there, right off the bat, this game that was supposed to be the return of Williams as a video game company, because there was a long pause where they stopped making video games. The return of video game at, at Williams with Eugene Jarvis coming back to make that game. And he came back and made it on his own terms, just kind of blew everything up. And that's, yeah. And then you'll you see... Through that to Smash TV to Mortal Kombat, you see that evolution happen. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you said that it was educational because that was my point was that I didn't want to make a movie that's just all about praising something. You know, you see a lot of documentaries out there just like, you know, celebrities talking about, oh, yeah, yeah, I love this game. Yeah, everyone talking about you know, how much they love something, but they don't really talk about anything else, you know, under, you know, under the surface. And so I really wanted to show, hey, this is where it comes from. This is the business of arcade. This is why games are designed a certain way. You know, I want people to come out of it really understanding why certain decisions were made the way they were. You gave us a full on history of, of everything really that went down in those days and it, not just that what happened, but also who was involved. I mean, you mentioned Eugene Jarvis, everybody yeah. in the documentary seemed to respect this guy with like, as a sort of God of arcade games. Like, could you yeah. tell us a bit about maybe your experience or I guess opinion? Of him? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, for us, you know, uh, for, you know, for us, Eugene Jarvis is truly the godfather of video games. Like, you know, I can speak for myself personally, even before I started working at Midway, I knew who Eugene Jarvis was. I was an arcade video game player, heavy arcade video game player during the 80s. So, you know, Defender, Robotron, you know, Stargate and all, you know, all those games. Um, I geeked out heavily enough that I was reading 
the magazines of that era, finding out who made what games. And, it, and I knew who Eugene Jarvis was. And, you know, I remember my first day working at Midway, I had no idea Eugene Jarvis was there. Like he was still <laughs> at William and it blew my mind. I was like awestruck by him and he was just like the nicest guy. And so, you know, and again, this was something that really wasn't planned when I started the documentary because I was just like, I'm going to just start off talking about Mortal Kombat and NBA Jam and maybe how those games were made. But then the more I interview people, the I realized I wasn't the only person that thought Eugene Jarvis was a god. Like these guys were, you know, the way they were talking, they were like, yeah, I was in a com- I I, wor- I wanted to work here because of Eugene. I was influenced by Eugene in this way. Eugene had his fingerprints on everything, even on the games that he didn't work on, just because of his personality. Him being in the same room with people is infectious, you know. And you see in the documentary the way he laughs. He's like this evil scientist. He just, <laughs> you know, he's just demented, and it rubbed off on all of us. And so you know, it, it's like this uh, weird fraternity that we all have with each other, even now after all these years. Um, we may not have all gotten along with each other, but we all had this camaraderie, um, that all came from working with Eugene in all these, you know, different ways. So, so it, it was nice. And, um, I don't know if you guys ever seen this movie called the right stuff. Um, but it was, yeah, yeah so it's one of my favorite movies and it doesn't sound really strange, but that movie actually inspired a lot of the storytelling in insert coin, because for me, Eugene Jarvis was, um, was Chuck Yeager. You know, he was a pioneer that started it all. And then he he basically influenced everybody who went on to such, you know, big things on their own. That's so cool. Like, yeah, I love it. I love hearing about kind of the background of how you what inspired you to make this movie and like how you made it, because these type of things carry over when you start talking about it. Like so anybody who hasn't seen it, I definitely recommend checking this out because it's it's awesome. Thanks. Um, one of the things in it throughout the the whole movie, you speak to several different people from the midway days, um, including John Tobias, who, you know, he's kind of been like until recently missing in action as far as the Mortal Kombat community is concerned. Um, so are you still on good terms with a lot of these people from midway and, and everything? I think you mentioned earlier how you. you- oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, it's the it, it's weird. You know, it's everyone has, you know, all kinds of their, their personalities and stuff. And like, like I said earlier, we, we didn't always all get along all the time. So, but it, it's, it's almost like this weird thing where like, we're siblings, you know, like if we're all in the same town, we'll get together, you know, <laughs> if we're at GDC or whatever and stuff, if somebody, you know, if somebody is asking, you know, for a favor or something like that, you know, somebody will respond and such. So yeah, yeah everyone gets along. Um, in their in their own unique ways and such, and we all try to get you know get together as much as possible. And uh, and like like John, you know, that you mentioned, he, you know, he just kind of he he's a very private person. He goes kind of goes out and does his own thing. But it's been nice seeing him kind of popping up a little bit more now. So he's making himself a little bit more visible um, than he used to. But he's like he's you know he's like an unsung hero. Obviously Mortal Kombat people know John very well, you know, but just the video game community in general, like should know more about him because he is, you know, he's one of the great artists of video games uh, through, you know, through video game history. And so, you know, I, and, and, you know, I, I feel very lucky that he's such a close friend and, uh, and spent, you know, spend a lot of hours with me talking for this for this documentary i feel bad i feel like i should just release all the footage out there because there's so much <laughs> I, don't know I mean you say that and i'm so happy to hear you say that but because like that also does actually come up in the documentary itself i can't remember who said it but somebody was saying how they realized very early on how switched on how vital john tobias was and would be in the future and i'm so glad to hear that still carries forward to today yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And uh yeah, he's 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 still doing great stuff. He's just he's just he's he's one of those people that's very private and he doesn't walk around, you know, swinging his dick around or anything. You know, he's just a really, <laughs> really good guy. Well, I mean, so you've you're obviously in touch with uh, John Tobias. How about Ed Boon? I cuz as far as I remember from the documentary, I noticed that he turns up in footage, but I don't think he yeah. actually appeared as an interview. Yeah. So, I mean, there were a lot of people that, we, you know, that I wasn't able to get. And obviously Ed is, you know, if, you know, is a big person to, you know, that that's missing from the film. And, you know, 
and I've talked with that many times, you know, before the film and then since then, such, and, you know, he's in it. I never really pushed him. Like I asked him, you know, quite a few times and he, you know, he wasn't able to talk about the film because yeah, yeah. Think, think about it this way. He's still the, the figurehead for Mortal Kombat. He works for Warner brothers. It's very, it, it puts people in a tough position to talk very openly about things, you know, and not that he has anything to hide or anything like that, but it's more like, you got to be careful about what you say because, you know, there's a fear of getting misconstrued and such, especially nowadays. And and especially so, with Ed. Especially, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, you know, and you'll see that, you know, it's the personality of all of, of all the people in the film is that they'll speak openly and talk about them. They were all very candid about things. And, but, you know, it, they, but I can understand the, the, the caution that's needed. So I never really pushed Ed heavily on it. Um, you know, he's seen the film obviously and such. And, you know, and I just, yeah, I, we all, like I said, we all get along. So I have to be very respectful of, you know, of his, of his, you know, privacy basically. So uh, I know your documentary from the original Kickstarter yeah. premiere, but for those who don't, what's the best way for people to access it at this point? Oh, so, I mean, the best way is uh, all the links are on insertcoindoc.com. Um, so it, it's out on, uh, on all, uh, all the VOD platforms. So, um, uh, prime video, uh, Apple TV, um, Vudu, Google, you know, even uh, even YouTube and such, and then uh, and then there's and then there's also Blu-ray, and the Blu-ray is actually has a ton of bonus content um, on top of it. That's the only place that has the bonus content is on that. So digitally or physical media, uh, you can just go to insertcoindoc.com. And now after Mortal Kombat, I guess what you're sort of doing now. As far as we can tell, you are the co-founder of not one, but two interactive studios. Yeah. So it, um, we, so me, John Tobias and Dave Mikicic left Midway 99 to start um, a studio called Studio Gigante. And, uh, and we were an, ex- an Xbox exclusive develop, uh, development team uh, back in the day. And so we did a game called Tao Fang. And then after that, WrestleMania 21. Um, and then the team, this, well, the company got disbanded, you know, for many reasons and such. And then I ended up going to uh, EA and worked on the Fight Night series. Um, and then around 2008, when the financial markets all crapped out and such, um, e, uh, EA closed the Chicago studio. And from there, I started up a new studio with Activision called Robomoto. And we took over the, uh, the Tony Hawk franchise from there. And so those are the two studios that, uh, that I worked with. And then, and then Robomoto um uh lasted until 20 gosh i want to say 2017 i left road motor around 2016 um to pursue working on the film some more and uh and and that's what led me here <laughs> i mean what a resume like you got mortal Kombat, tony hawk uh the wwf games that you mentioned earlier um i think you did something for wwe also didn't you yeah yeah i did do i did two w oh yeah two wrestling games wwf and wwe and then worked on fight night and then at one point when i when i was after fight night we did fight Night round three at ea chicago and then after that we were working on a marvel game and it was like a big marvel brawler game um that ended up never getting released there's some videos of it uh, up on youtube now like somebody found the dev kit that has it and such but it was a crazy massive marvel game that um much like special forces was just way too ambitious and probably would have never made it to market <laughs> if but luckily or unluckily they closed up that division of ea anyway so we'll never know so you have mentioned a few times throughout just this conversation uh mm-hmm about like technology and stuff. And you are obviously very, uh, I guess, involved in, I mean, based on what I can see as well, you're working now on augmented and virtual reality. You were part of the tech week 100. You were part of Crane's business tech as well. I mean, are you focusing mostly now on virtual reality and such? What's the plan? Yeah, it's, so I'm doing a lot of, um, you know, experiential design work and stuff. And so, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's it's definitely some VR and AR stuff, but like you know, I'm doing things like um, you know I'm designing a 360 theater uh, with a film made specifically for it. You know, so it's kind of weird. Like I, like after I had left games to kind of finish up Insert Coin, uh, a lot of the opportunities that popped up for me have been this weird hybrid of game technology and film and film video technology and 
I'll tell you, I don't know how that happened. I mean, it's just like, I like to say it happened just completely just by accident and such, you know, um, but it's, it's been really amazing to see. And, and, you know, it's, it's been nice to be able to kind of have my foot in both, in both doors at the same time. So yeah, I've been doing a lot of that, like with my the most recent project, it doesn't sound really weird, but the, my most recent project I did with my team was, um, uh, the new SoFi stadium out in Los Angeles. Um, brand new billions of dollars it's like the most expensive stadium in the world and uh and we designed um a tour of the entire stadium that involves uh film video content interactive machines out on the field we did this uh tunnel run experience um and it was just wild just doing all the stuff and it's all kind of wrapped up in an app and photo kiosk with ar stuff and everything else like that and uh and so that's like my life has been these weird projects that are completely different from each other and it's been a ton of fun just kind of learning new things at that time at the same time do you have anything coming up or any ongoing projects that you'd like to share with our viewers um boy nothing that's not under nda <laughs> gotcha, yeah <laughs> i hate to say that um, but i mean the sofi um the tours that just opened up recently i mean i am you know working for on uh on the beginnings of another documentary. Um, and that's, that's somewhat game related. There's, there are a the few subjects that I'm looking into right now. And, uh, and hopefully, um, hopefully one of them will get me inspired enough to keep moving out there, but they're all in like very early pre-production right now. So I kind of, you know, people who know me know that I, I tend to do have a lot of things going on at the same time. doesn't mean that we're, I'm doing them all at the same time, but I'd like to kind of have, quite a few things juggling and then kind of see which one lands, you know, lands best. Better to see what comes our way then for me, because it's it's always very creative and very interesting to hear. Um, Oh, thank you. One thing I also do want to hear is uh, what is your favorite finisher from Mortal Kombat? Oh gosh. So the, and I always forget the names of them, but like the one with Kung Lao where it basically takes his hat off and cuts the person in half. From Mortal Kombat 2? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, I've always liked that one. Now, here's a weird thing: is that, and this this probably shows more my age than anything else. Is that I really love the fatalities in the old games. It's yeah. kind of technology has gotten to a point now where they're so gruesome that, like, for me, the humor is is now just like kind of gets obliterated mm. by. I say that all the, the time level, by the level of detail. You know, what yeah. I mean? like even even like the early. 3D games, it was fine because there was this, this, there was enough of a separation and technology that it was humorous. It, it still felt cartoonish because it was just yeah. it just didn't look real. Now it, you you cross this uncanny valley of gore, mm-hmm. and so I still think a lot of them are pretty damn funny. And, and knowing the personalities of the of the guys working on this, oh yeah, that's totally them. But there's a, there are some of them where I'm watching and it's just like holy crap! I just I don't even want to look at them. Right? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think in Insert Coin, I, I allude to to one of those moments, and it was just. And I remember um, the first time my wife saw that segment in Insert Coin, where I compare old Fatality versus you know versus the new ones. She's just like, "Holy crap! Like what? Like, that is insane!" And I was like, "Yeah, I know." And like even I get sickened by it. So. When anytime I play Johnny Cage, if I have to, if I do a Fatality on Cassie, I'm like. Oh, oh that's, yeah. that was my daughter. And it, and it looks like a real person that I've just dismantled. <laughs> like, I feel bad. I'm on the yeah. inside. It hurts my soul. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's weird. And, and again, it's like, you know, it's, it, yeah, I don't think, you know, I'm not going to say it's the game. It's probably more me than anything and such. But it's like when I see the old, you know, the older fatalities, it's like I, I still chuckle because it's just so ludicrous looking. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and you must be a big fan of the old friendships then as well. What's that? You must be a big fan of the friendships then, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, Josh, before we let you go, where can our listeners find you? Oh, um, I mean, so, you know, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, you know, I don't say much of anything of interest. I don't talk about games a whole lot. So, <laughs> so if you want to follow me and read about stupid things like what's the best, you know, cup noodle, you know, that I find oh, at HM. That's, that's all you have to say. That, yeah, that's the place to go. <laughs> Yeah, you're, yeah, that's the place to go to. Um, so but that's the main thing, and and then there's also um, a Twitter a Twitter account for Insert Coin. So that's at Insert Coin Doc. Um, but yeah, either of those, you know, if you for some crazy reason want to see what I'm up to, I'm pretty pretty active on those. Before you disappear, uh, just I have to check. Yeah. Do I have to wait and check your Twitter, or can I just ask you now what the best cup noodle is? 
Oh, the, so no, no. You can, the best <laughs> noodle on top is um, is the, uh, the the curry one. I don't know if you guys ever had the curry cup you. noodle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's funny. Like this pan- I, I really like. Not that I didn't know about cup noodles before, but during the pandemic, I just like. I'm gonna research cup noodles. And it's amazing. It's it's such a like it's like I went into a deep dive on it, and so now you know I think once a week I hit one of the Asian markets nearby me and just try to find something new. The tech is you know what it is is that it's a tech geek in me. Is like I look at the food as not just food because it's barely food, but it's really more about like wow the technology to make something like this is amazing. You know the dehydration, all that stuff. So. I'm so glad I asked this question. I'm actually so glad. <laughs> now I'm going to have to tweet about this. <laughs> so everybody can check when they check your Twitter. Yeah. Now. I'm, now I'm committed. To- <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd like to thank all of our listeners for stopping by the Robecast. And Josh, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. It was a pleasure to have you on. Thank oh, you no, th- thanks for asking me. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's been a lot of fun. You can find Yanni and myself, Phantom, on the Mortal Kombat group on Facebook, as well as Yanni on the Mortal Kombat meme realm. Special thanks to Uppercut Editions for their continued support. You can follow them at Uppercut LLC on Twitter and the Mortal Kombat Encyclopedia Project on Facebook. You can catch up on all episodes of the Realmcast on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, and Spotify. 